and welcome to this week's episode of The Language of Leadership. I'm your host, Chuck Marting, and today we have a special guest with us, David Ask. David, welcome to the podcast. Hey, brother. Man, thanks for having me. I'm really glad to be here. Well, it's it's exciting to have people that are uh, leaders to be able to come and, and talk to us and to share their experiences and the things that they've learned uh, in leadership. And you know, with that, I if you would do me a favor and, and our audience a favor, just kind of give us a little background on yourself first before we get started and and we'll go from there. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I, I grew up in a little town in Minnesota, actually called Glenwood, and it's a little town with one stoplight and a couple of golf courses and a beautiful lake and and a lot of amazing people. And um, but I actually moved to Nashville Tennessee when I was uh, 20. So I've, I've been here, um, man, it's been, well, since 1994. So yeah, 28 years. And uh, I found a, a beautiful lady that, that grew up down here. And so we ended up getting married 23 years ago. And um, wow. we've got two kids. My son Parker is a senior in high school. And my daughter Kate is a sophomore. So yeah. Awesome. So tell us a little bit about your your business and what it is that you do and uh, how leadership has played a key role in that for you. Yeah. So, you know, I, yeah, long story short, um, I own a company called Quorum Global and we, uh, we manufacture um, currently, we're working on a few different products right now, but we manufacture um, a product called the StatGuard Plus and it's a, a, a thermostat cover with a combination lock. Um, so I was actually in uh, facilities for a long time with a large telecom chain and in our stores and call centers and so on, we would often use thermostat guards so that people wouldn't, you know, jack around with the temperature and so on. And it was a, honestly a, a really big problem. And um, the problem though with that was, is everybody had, you know, every stat guard had a key, you know, this little tiny key and nobody could keep track of that stinking thing. So um out of that, the Stat Guard Plus was born. It, my, it was actually my brother-in-law's um, idea, um, and um, I, I now own the company. But um, yeah, we sell in uh, over three thousand retail stores now. Wow. We're um, coming out with a, a couple of different variations. We've got a few different variations on the market now. But the uh, first quarter of next year, we're coming out with a new one that, that's going to be kind of designated for the the pro channel, like um, supply houses and and things like that. So it'll be non-retail. Um, just a different uh, um, model number there. And um, yeah, so I'm, I'm doing that. I've got a, other, a few other products that I'm working on as well. And I, I'm kind of a creative at heart, really. I, I love I love ideas. And I like, you know, starting with an idea and bringing something to the marketplace of value. So kind of a, a, a little curveball here is actually I, I moved to Nashville like a million other people for music. Mm. And um, I was a spent a, a couple of years at uh, Belmont University here and as a vocal major. So I've actually uh, cut three records and um, have performed on stages all over the country. And wow. I still, I still do um, still do that as well on, on the weekends and so on. It's uh, um, just near and dear to my heart. You know, I'm, I'm really grateful for some really fun opportunities to share the stage with the uh, people that I've, you know, admired my whole life and, Right. So write a few songs with people that I kind of dreamt about writing with and then perform wow, in front cool. of some in front of some crowds, actually, where I've had to, you know, sign some non-disclosure agreement. So I can't even talk about it, which is kind of exciting. Wow. But um, um, yeah, as of late, you know, my my life is really revolved around running my business and as well as helping other entrepreneurs um, grow, you know, get through um obstacles to see themselves as they truly are right and not as they kind of think they are and kind of have that big question mark and so on so when you you know brought up the this podcast you know with regards to leadership i'll be honest i've learned um a lot about what i i thought leadership was and what i think it is now and it's kind of shifted here especially in the last few years you know, I was kind of smiling just a minute ago because uh, when you're talking about your product that you make, there's a there's a book, and I don't know if you've read it. It's called Future Proofing You by okay. Jay uh, Jay um, Jay Samet. There you go, S A M I T. Okay. And one of the things that he teaches in that book is is exactly what you just talked about. In fact, what he encourages you to do for 30 days is to have some 
three by five index cards and write down a couple ideas that you've had that day. Yeah. And the, and the, the whole point of that is to be able to go back after 30 days and find something that's going to allow you to do exactly what you just said. So that, that's pretty cool. Um, yeah, thank you. You know, you said something kind of key that I, I, I think that a lot of people in leadership um, come across and that is we have all experienced leadership in one way or another, either positive or negative. Sure. We've all had those nightmare people that, you know, you, you would just as soon never have met because they make your life miserable. And then there was supervisors or, or leaders that you've had that you would do anything, go above and beyond for them, no questions asked. And yeah. and sometimes you would look for reasons to support them because you just loved how they led. Yeah. And yeah. it sounds like you had that kind of an experience and that's what's kind of led you to do the things that you're doing and how leadership has um, formed for you. So would you mind sharing us a glimpse into that as to what that was and, and what your feeling is on leadership? The one thing that you feel would help other people in our audience as far as looking at their own leadership and what they can do to become a better leader? Yeah, absolutely. So I was actually sitting with a friend of mine, uh, Paul DeBrito. He's a, a really, really crazy, uh, creative and pretty successful entrepreneur himself. Um, we were hanging out last night and he used a phrase and I'll kind of paraphrase it. He said, people often get promoted to their highest level of incompetence. And because they happen to be good at one thing, right? Well, let's put them in management. You know, let's, let's make them a director. Let's make them a VP. When what they were really great at, you know, is this one, you know, particular zone of genius and so on. So what I, what I found out, you know, and I spent 17 years, like I said, at a large uh, telecom chain and quite often, um, you know, the, the the people that I worked under, you know, like you said, right, I'd take a bullet for them. Like, they're just absolutely awesome people. But then you found people that were, of course, I think just miserable. You know, they they were in a position in their work where they felt um, like they their skill sets didn't match what they were being asked to do. So they, they had a lot of fear, and all of that fear just came pouring out. Mm-hmm. So they, they were kind of acting outside of their identity. You know, it wasn't true to their nature. And um, it's funny that, you know, some of these guys that I'm thinking about that, you know, we still keep in contact. It's been, I guess, over four years since I've, I've been, in, um, you know, self-employed. And there's one of my favorite quotes. And I really feel like it's kind of my mission statement in life. A guy named Benjamin Disraeli, he's a, a former PM of England. Mm-hmm. Um, he, sa- he says, the greatest good that you can do for another is not to give them your riches, but to reveal to him his own. Wow. And what I think is just absolutely powerful is, is the people that, you know, that I have worked for that I have, um, you know, just, you know, like I said, you take a bullet for them. It's like, you know, without even thinking, it's like, man, these people are just honest. They're kind. And, but the main thing, right. Is they are for you. They were for me. And with, with such sincerity, such genuineness. And um, I, uh, you know, it's funny when I joined, you know, the ISI mastermind, one of the guys that was, it's in my group, Dr. Andy Garrett, um, you know, has really helped me kind of understand, you know, a, a lot of things, you know, and with regards to leadership, you know, the the great leaders have a great identity, right? It's they, they understand who they are with radical clarity. There's not a question mark inside their heart, inside their mind. And when they enter a space, they have an agenda, but it's not a selfish agenda. It's not a fear-driven agenda. It's not, you know, protectionist agenda. They have an agenda to make sure that everyone in that room has clarity, has room to grow, room to thrive, room to flourish, and they understand, you know, the main thing is the main thing. Here's where we're going. And guess what? That's not the point. People mm. are the point. Mm. So so when you sense that from a great leader, right? When he's looking around the room, he's scanning, you know, his, his reports, as it were. He's not thinking, how can I use this person and stand upon their shoulders so I can rise higher? He's thinking, how can I use the greatest good 
right? My identity, those things that I identify with to, to cause this person to grow with no strings attached. I mean, to, to me, that is the, the ultimate um, definition of a leader. You know, I, I use that word, you know, um, genuine or authentic. And, and again, this is, this is, you know, Dr. Andy Garrett's the guy that really helped, you know, introduce me to this, this idea of authenticity, right? When someone is, is, is authentic, it's, it's funny. You're, when you're with somebody like that, you end up seeing um, a genuineness, you know, there's, there's more of a cur- courageous spirit about them. Um, they have a, I don't know, you know, when I think about the guys that I work for, there's a compassion, you know, like, like if you were to call them and say, Hey, you know, I can't come in today. Their first reaction isn't, Oh God, you know, they don't, re- they're like, you know, David, what's up? What can I do for you? You know, there's, there's a, there's an, they, they, they believe that you are bringing your best. You know, there's a genuineness about them. There's a, there's kind of a freedom in that relationship. You know, that doesn't seem like it's being coaxed or coerced. So what's fascinating is, is when someone really understands their, you know, who they are and what they're bringing to the table, um, it's the, the uh, this idea of great leadership just kind of bubbles to the top. Mm-hmm. It, doesn't, it, it doesn't have to be uh, drummed up or, you know, coerced or, or, or uh, you know... I don't know. It, it it just seems it seems pure. It seems good. It seems noble, as opposed to this person is obviously scared out of their mind, but yet they're trying to be very nice and so that everybody will like them. And when I leave the room, you know, they're probably talking behind my back, that kind of thing. And and we've all been there. So yeah. anyway, there's my my first kind of uh, take on on what I think leadership can be. Anyway, dude, that was very very powerful and profound. And I think the, the one thing that you mentioned that, that I, I, I've seen the same thing in its sincerity. Yeah. There was no hidden agenda. There was, there was no agenda. I was that person's agenda. Yeah. In the way that they approached me. Yeah. It wasn't so much coming up to me and saying, you need to do this, this, and this as much as it was, what can I do to help you? Right. And and that makes the world a difference. One of yeah. my friends that uh, was my, one of my first supervisors when I was an officer, um, Sergeant John Vermilli, and, and he's retired now. And he uh, kind of did an intro to one of my classes on the loneliness of leadership. And he talked about that, how being a, a leader um, can be a very lonely place as yeah. far as that same thing that you just said, where you were part of the group, you may have been promoted within to become the new leader. And so the same guys you eat with, now you go into that break room to go grab something to drink and it's silent because you're now one of them. Yeah. And that was one of the things that, that he had to show people was that, you know, his sincerity and his, his love for the troops was sincere. You knew when that man walked into the room, what his agenda was. And it wasn't himself. Yeah. (laughs) It was everybody that was in that room and making sure for us that we got home to our family safe. That was his number one priority. And and I, many people that I know that I worked with over the years that had John as a, as a supervisor, like you were saying, they, they would walk through fire for this man because of how he treated them. And, and I think it's what you said. It resonates when you get in front of somebody like that and they're sincere. That's it. They but don't hear to say anything else. Here, but you know, what's interesting about your story right there, right? Is it, it's, you're, you're kind of saying it without saying it though, that that's kind of rare. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's not like you're going to walk into an office or any setting and be like, I would take a bullet for everybody in this room, you know, on that level with that, with that, uh, that, that type of an affection, Right. And what I think is fascinating is, is when someone has an internal culture that is noble and kind and good, you know, and courageous and, um, and peace filled, you know, they're, they're, they're connected to their soul, right? They're bringing the, the, the best sense of who they are. They don't feel threatened by other people because they're not competing. Their, their goal is to make other people better around them. It's you you can't 
you can't put a candle to that. There's no, there's, there's no, uh, there's no amount of a lipstick, you know, that you can possibly put on another human being that's going to come close to someone who has that internal culture. I remember, I remember a while back, I, I had a bit more margin in my schedule and I, I thought, you know what, I'm going to go after some people that, um, that I think might be struggling, you know, just on, on whatever level. So, um, it's funny. There's a, a buddy of mine, Jason Elkins, who who has the Hundred Cups Academy, mm-hmm. and he te- he teaches people how to do you know uh, just talked to him last night. <laughs> Did you? Okay, yeah, he's a dear friend of mine, right? A hundred cups of coffee in a hundred days. You know, he's teaching people how to make relationships genuinely and sell, right? But it's it's such a great way to do that. But I actually kind of used his model and decided I'm going to try to have a cup of coffee with with somebody at least Monday through Friday for for no other reason. And just asking the question, sitting across from them, and usually I'd, you know, grab their forearm, and I'd say, you know, hey Chuck, what's going on today? You know, how how are you? And don't give me any bull crap. <laughs> and then I'd smile at them. <laughs> and it was fascinating how many people, you know, of course, right away started they they kind of chuckle, but they knew full well that I was there, um, and really at their disposal, like they had access to my heart to my mind, to the greatest good that I could give them in that moment. I was wanting them to flourish. I was wanting them to, to understand that there's a safe place to unpack some stuff here, you know, bring some, you know, light into darkness, um, say some things they just needed to get off their chest, whatever that is. And and it was amazing how, and I didn't really realize it, what was happening, but those people started to look to me as a leader and I noticed it in their um, in their language, and even some of the younger guys, you know, they they would they would actually be talking about me to someone else, and I, they would refer to me as their mentor. And but they, you know, and they, they'd be like, "Oh, I didn't know you were kind of you were mentoring so and so." And I'm like, well, "I didn't know that either." I uh, you know, but it's fascinating that you know it's and and, it's, and even as a Christian, right, the upside down kingdom, you know, all the all powerful God, right. Came in a manger, right. It's the upside down kingdom. What does that mean? It means that if you want to lead, it's, it's that act of service. It's me. It's you over me. It's not me over you. Like in our culture, right. Everybody's screaming from the rooftops, wanting to get noticed and climb the ladder and all that kind of stuff, but true leadership. And it really precludes this, this internal culture of stability Mm. of, of, of an anchoredness. I'm not compete. I'm not competing with anybody. I'm on mission to make sure that everybody around me not only survives, but thrives. And um, I'll be honest when I, I think I've been operating in that capacity for a long time, but when, when Andy Garrett, when Dr. Garrett, you know, helped me to start to assign meaning, you know, to some of those things that I really held dear, right? My core values. What does my core value? Mm -hmm. And I started to see my life through that lens and make decisions through that lens. Man, I mean, I feel like I'm flying. Why? Because it's, it's, it's clean fuel. I'm, I'm being the highest version of myself and it feels good. Mm. Right. You, you and I are, you and I are different people. So your 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 sense of purpose and and stuff is going to be nuanced in a much different way. But guess what, Chuck? You and I have the same purpose, just like everybody else, and that's to make sure that everyone around us thrives. We just do it uniquely. And so when you laser in on that uniqueness, that's when a leader really becomes, I think, bulletproof. They 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 become they be, they become someone that can't be challenged. Because they're already at the bottom of the ladder trying to lift everybody else up. There's nowhere to fall. It's the most solid, strong place that anybody can possibly stand and then build this life of service from. You know, you you look back at, I don't care if it's Socrates and Plato and Euclid and, you know, some of the Stoics, right? Everyone, in, including Jesus Christ, right, would agree that if you say you have a purpose in this life and it does not involve the causing of human flourishing, you don't have a, a purpose. You are a navel-gazing narcissist. And, and here's what's fascinating. The people that are staring at their own belly button their whole life, right? What, ha- what, what happens to them? 
they literally start to shrink. Their 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 thought of thoughts of what's possible start to shrink. Their friends group their friend groups shrink. Their income shrinks. They they start to get this you know they just become nothing. And what's fascinating is is just the opposite is true. When I realize that I was authored, right? Authenticity. I didn't make myself. I was authored and created for a specific reason. And I start acting out of that unique place. Well, then it's just like clockwork. The expanse of friendships, finances, joy, laughter, possibilities, ideas. It just starts to flourish out of that. And we can't escape that that's, that, that, that is the reality. So I, 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 really, I really go back to this idea of you know, the, that, well, it's, it really, it's that this really quote, right? For me, uniquely as a leader, and I think for everybody else, by the way, they ju we just do it differently. Um, I, as you can tell, right, I'm a talker. I, I love words and, and I love inspiring. I love inspiring anything. I don't care if I'm eating a sandwich. I want it to be inspiring. <laughs> um, later, later, I'm going golfing with my sister. And guess what? We're going to have an inspiring time talking about great things. That's awesome. but I, I really believe that leadership starts with this idea of an, an authentic centeredness and anchoredness, and then a life lived lifting others up around you. Can you imagine if every dad started his day with a full sense of who he was, whose he was right first, and then who he was? Mm -hmm. Can you imagine if that same man, and again, women also, right? But I'm just saying, since we're two dudes talking here. <laughs> Can you imagine then if that same man went into the workplace, right? Went into the culture with that same sense of anchoredness and his, his, his main mission in life was to cause everybody around him to thrive. This world would be stunning, but what do we have? We have people who have the big question mark of whose they are, the big question mark of who they are, the big question mark of purpose. And the proof is in the pudding. When you don't answer that internal culture question first, you have absolutely no basis to make any decision upon, let alone leadership. You know, you have a lot of words of wisdom there. And I, man, you, you've, you've got me thinking of a lot of different things right now. But there's one thing that I need to ask you, and, and that is I have found... And, and I'm sure that you have too. Um, men or women that have been put into a leadership position, they've never been a leader before per se. Yeah. They've, they're given this team. How, as a new person without any training, what would you say they would need to do to learn or to be able to take that ego part of it off the table. And the reason why I say that yeah. is it, it's only natural when you're put in. Right. I mean, look, when I was a police officer, guess what, man? My first day out there by myself, I wrote as many tickets as I could. You know why? Because I could. Right. And, okay. So you're going to test the waters a little bit. Hey, I'm the leader. You're going to do what I tell you. But then you got to back up and, and look at the whole picture of this. And, and now that now that, that you're there, how do you take that that part of it out of there to refocus and to do these other things that you're talking about? So so here's here's something I I think the painted picture in a in a in a way helps that like kind of the, this idea of story. So uh, there was a buddy of mine who was actually starting his own mastermind group and you know, and, and he was so caught up in, in his own head with regards to, will these people respect me? You know, well, on a, on a real basic level, I mean, he's worth millions of dollars. He's got, you know, pretty families doing pretty well. And I'm like, well, on a worldly level, right. They're going to look at you and be like, man, if I could only be like that, like that guy, sure. I'll follow him. But here's, here's the, the kicker with stuff like that is there's so many people out there, right. That are quote unquote successful. Mm -hmm. Um, they feel like a success or no, I'm sorry. They look like a success on the outside. They have the markers of success as, as Dr. Andy says, but they don't have, they don't feel like a success. They have the markers of success, but they don't feel like a success. And quite often it's because they have not answered, you know, the, the ultimate big questions with regards to authenticity and identity. So 
with regards to the story here and kind of painting this picture as far as a, a leader, you know, it's in that position, but yet they feel like they're drowning and, you know, they're, and so on. I'll be honest. I think that, that if, if, for instance, well, let's go back to my buddy who wanted to start his mastermind. What I told him was, as I said, your only goal needs to be that by the end of this first year, that if you die and these men cannot get a plane ticket to your funeral, that they're going to look at their wives and say, hey, babe, I'll be back in a few days. And they hop in the car and they start driving. You know, wow. they're willing to they're, they're willing to drive 1500 miles to be at your funeral because they couldn't get a flight and they won't miss it. What type of a person, and you back into that, what type of a person does it take to inspire someone, you know, to drive 24 hours to your funeral and to pay last respects, right? It's, it goes back to that quote. The greatest good is not that you can give someone your riches, but to reveal to him his own. And when you look at another man, another woman, and you start validating those things that you see, right? You're reading their label. They're inside the peanut butter jar and you're reading their label for them because they can't read it. Mm -hmm. And you start telling them with your words, man, I love when you say things like that. You know, you're, you're giving them feedback that helps them to know when they are shining, you know, at their, at their finest. Um, I, I think that, you know, quite often there might be moments, you know, in a, a manager's life or whatever, where they just need to say, Hey, yeah, I'm, I, I was put in a position that, that I don't want to be in, you know, like, this is not authentic to me. I don't like managing people. So I would just say, you know, have the courage to say that. But if, if you have the desire to manage people, to lead well, and you're in a position where you feel like you're drowning, the only place you can start is to, is to uh, tap into authenticity and identity. You have to assign meaning to those things that are, that are the hierarchy, right, of your core values, of your virtues, right? Out, outward thinking, the virtue is outward thinking, core value is inward. What impact do I want to have? What virtuous impact do I want to have uniquely? What, what frame of reference am I making decisions on when I talk to people and, you know, make other decisions, right? You're this, this, this matrix of values. And, um, and then of course, you know, different strengths and strengths and things like that. I, uh, it's amazing how fast you can develop that stuff if people ask you the right question. And I'm not trying to, you know, pitch for Dr. Andy here, but of course that's his whole business is he helps people, doesn't tell them what they should do and think. He, he just asks amazing questions for those people to identify for themselves those things. And then you have a, you know, a whole new way of looking at life and, and responding and operating. It's not that big question mark in your heart and your head and your soul and over your head that everybody sees because mm -hmm. you're fidgeting and you're nervous and you're angry and you're, you know, fragmented and you've got apathy and avoidance and the whole nine yards. What happens when you, when you identify those things as a leader and you can do that very quickly, by the way, well, then that resilience comes back. The, you know, clarity of purpose, you're connected to that. You're, you know, the best sense of yourself you, you trust yourself, mm -hmm. you know, you, you can kind of relax into who you are as opposed to trying to manufacture something you think people are going to like. Yeah. And there's a big difference there. One, one is filled with probably some success with a ton of anxiety. And the other one is filled with, with ultimate success and a bunch of peace. And again, it's not some utopia here. We live in a broken world and things happen, but at the same time, there's a big difference between Le inspiring leaders, right? Inspire means to breathe life into, right? So inspiring leaders, people that are breathing life into other people and leaders that lead by, you know, fear and whatever else. And uh, of course, those people are constantly training new people because nobody sticks around long-term with somebody like that. Mm -hmm. David, you've given us a lot to think about and I, and I, and I really appreciate your insight and what you've sure. shared with us today on the language of leadership. I got a couple things left that I'd like to do with you real quick before we wrap up. And the, and the first thing I'd like to do is I just want to take a moment to acknowledge you and, and let you know that um, what you shared today and what you're doing matters. And Thank you. it's making an impact on people. Uh, you might not realize it today. You might realize it tomorrow, but 
it'll come back. Uh, I, I truly believe that. And to be able to give of yourself and, and to be able to do so in a way that you're wanting to see other people develop and to be able to grow is uh, something that this world truly does need. And we need to have more men and women like you that are willing to give of themselves to see somebody else succeed. So I want to thank you for doing that. Yeah, thank you for saying that. The other thing I wanted to do is I, I have found over time, like we talked about earlier before the show, a leader is not born. A leader is developed. It's something that you learn and something you grow into. And men like Benjamin Franklin and Andrew Carnegie, and there's a whole list of them that throughout their lives learned from other leaders. They were constant readers. They were constantly referring things to people. <clears throat> Having that in mind, you know, you, you come across somebody or even like you're talking about seeing your sister here in a little bit and you guys go out and golf. What is the one thing that you would look in, at her or somebody else and say, you know what, you've really got to read this. This is really going to help you. What is that one book or that one reference that you would give somebody that they just have to be able to take in to help them be a better person, better leader? Man, can I mention two books? You bet. You okay. Bet. So, so one of them is the go giver and it's really popular. I, I just read it uh, last, last year. Um, and it's uh, um, a, a dear friend of mine gave that to me and I couldn't put it down. And it's to me, it just, it, it's a, just a life of, of giving with no expectation in return and what the joy of that is. And then, um, and then a, a guy named Chris Kelso with a Chris with a K um, Kelso with a K he uh, wrote a book called um, overcoming the imposter mm. you know, talking about imposter syndrome, right? You know, when that, that this whole idea, you walk into a room and you're just comparing yourself to everybody around you and you're just start to shrink and that kind of stuff. And it was really helpful for me, but he has a, um, well, you know what? I'm not even going to give away the give away the hook there. But I, if 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 you ever, if there's anybody listening to this and you are struggling with imposter syndrome, you know, you feel like you're less than compared to everybody, especially entrepreneurs and leaders. You have to read that book. It is. It was the language that he uses, the paradigms that he paints, and so on, have been just so incredibly helpful for me. And because, like I said, we don't live in a utopia, right? We've got we've got inundation with head trash all day long mm -hmm. and we have to be able to combat that. And um, so that's a great read. Awesome. I will have that in the show notes for everybody. I'll also have uh, your contact information and how to get a hold of you in case there's some follow-up conversations that people want to have um, so that they can look to you for some guidance or direction or maybe just to reach out and connect to see the things that you're doing and accomplishing. So that's awesome. I just want to uh, thank you again for uh, coming on to the language of leadership. And I'm sure that at some point we'll have you back on again to uh, give us some more wisdom and some more advice and, and some direction that we all need in, in today's world and, and leading um, not only ourselves, but our teams and, and people we come in contact. So hey, thanks man, for being honor, on the show. Oh, honor to be here. Thank you. All right. <laughs> 